So uh, today we are here to talk about namespaces, symbols, and vars, which um, is a super important topic um, and one that I think um, people struggle with a little bit. But before we do that, I wanted to just take a second and kind of reflect on Rich's keynote, which um, I think I only have one thing to say. Um, pretty cool stuff. So my name is Craig Andera. Um, there's my Twitter info. I work at Relevance. There's a bunch of us here. Uh, come find me after if you have any questions. There's my email. You can you can reach me. Let's um let's jump in. Um, so who do I want to talk to today? I want to talk to people who've been using Clojure at least a little bit. So if I put parentheses parentheses up here, people are going to be like, what's that? Um, but at the same time, I'm expecting that you are still struggling somewhat with the concepts of namespaces, symbols, and vars. Um, so you notice I say people who have written a book. So Stuart, you you got to leave. Um, yeah, if you're if you're raise your hand if you've ever confused or if you are still maybe somewhat confused about the difference between require, require and refer. That get anybody? Yeah, everybody goes through that. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna fix that today, among other things. Okay. So what we're really trying to do here is fill that middle gap. You know enough closure to read it, you can write it, but you may be not clear about all this stuff. So um, that's what we're trying to get to. So I think in order to do this, we should analyze some code. Here's the code I'd like to analyze. There's everything that we need to know to get to the next level with namespaces, symbols, and vars right here. This is all we need. Hello world, OK? We've got a namespace macro up here. There's this require thing. What the hell is that? A function that prints stuff, right? Get everything we need. So memorize that. And hopefully, there's nobody here for which this code is confusing, right? In other words, the effect of it. Everybody knows that this is a piece of closure that you could run from the command line and you know, say uh, you know hello foo bar and it would print out hello you know foo and bar right. There's nothing mystical. You might not know this one. This is the join. It's just this is just a function in the closure string namespace that smashes strings together and puts another word in between them. No big deal. Not super important for our for our analysis. We're really after like what does this mean? Like what's going on here? Right. We've got this file. We wrote it. We put it in hello.clj. And then something happened. What happened? It got loaded, and then it got evaluated. Okay, now this is important, okay, um, because this is where things already start to get a little bit funky. So um, I want to uh, dig into this a little bit, especially the evaluation part. And where it really starts, right? The really the place where you want to begin when you when you think about this stuff is thinking about that that loading and evaluation phase, right? We started with this code. It's a bunch of text on on a, in a file somewhere, right? It's in hello.clj. It's a bunch of text, right? There's a paren, there's the character n, there's s, uh, then there's the character s, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not what gets run, right? What happens is that Clojure is going to walk up and turn that into what? A bunch of data structures, right? This is this gets turned. It's not. This is this is string. This is a string, right? Clojure doesn't evaluate strings. It evaluates data structures. So it's going to read this in. You've heard that term before. There's a reader that turns this string into a bunch of data structures. Well, we know what it turns it into. There's a list, right? Parentheses are a list. Then it reads this thing right here, the NS. Anybody know what that turns into at read time? It's a symbol, right? In fact, there's symbols all over in this place. Here's a list. It's got a symbol here, a symbol here. This is a keyword. Symbol, 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 symbol. So it's kind of important to understand like what the rules are. Um, um, so, and, and the way this process starts is with uh, require, right? Require is kind of the primary API. There are a bunch in Clojure for loading files, but the main one that you will be concerned with, for the most part, is require. Require is load. You should think of it as this is the loading API, right? Remember, I, I asked you who's confused about require, refer, blah, blah, blah use, blah, I don't know. <laughs> if you remember require is load, you're 25% of the way there. Require is load, require is load, require is load, okay? What does it take? It takes a namespace name. What does it do? It goes and looks for a file in a jar. Maybe, it, maybe it's in source, depending on how you're set up. But it goes and it looks for that file, that hello, right? That hello file that we wrote. It reads it into data structures like we talked about, and then it evaluates them. It says, oh, there's a list. And the first element is a symbol, and the second element is a vector. I'm going to do something with that. Um, require also lets you provide an alias, and we'll see that in a second. So. Here's this method, require. What does it take? It takes the name of a library. 
right? The name of this library happens to be net.cgrand.enlive-html. Anybody here ever worked with Enlive? It's a really cool library. Yeah, it's, a, it's an HTML templating library. It doesn't really matter. I just picked this one because it's got a couple cool things in it. It's got dots in the name, and it's got dashes, right? What are the rules for loading? Well, there better be a file called Enlive underscore HTML, dashes turn into underscores. It better be in a directory called cgrand, and that directory better be in a directory called net. Right? Dots turn into slashes, uh, uh, dashes turn into underscores. If you say require net cgrand and live HTML, notice it has to be quoted in this form. Right? Um, once you do that, it will go and find that file, load it, and evaluate it. And somewhere in that file is a line of code that says defin render. There's a render function in there. Okay? And now we can use it. We can call, this is a call to the render function. But notice, in order to do that, we have to use this namespace thingy, right? You have to say net cgrand and live HTML slash render, okay? Require doesn't, this is, when you do require, this is what you get. The code has been loaded. There is a function called render, but it's kind of over there. And we'll talk about what that means in a minute, okay? Now, this is kind of annoying, right? In live, you got to type all this out. Uh, you can do a little bit better if instead of... Um, uh, a, a, a symbol, right, net cgrand and live HTML, you give it a sequence. If the, fir the first thing names the library, then you can have an as, and then you can give it an alias. And that just saves some typing. That just says, you know what? HTML now means net cgrand uh, and live HTML. And so now you still have to use the namespace. You still have to say HTML slash render, but you can do it. So here we go. We're loading. We've got loading. Yay. Okay. So that's kind of step one. All right, so now we said that require finds the file, loads it up, and evaluates it. What does that mean? Oh, I'm sorry, there's a question here. Why do you have to single quote the, uh, the name? You're, are you talking about right here? Oh, the vector? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so how does evaluation and closure work, right? Recursively. The vector itself is, is um, evaluates to itself, which we'll talk about that in a second. But the things inside it get evaluated too. What does a symbol evaluate to? If you knew the answer to that, you wouldn't be here. Right? We're going to talk about that. Right? The reason is because we don't want this net C grand and live HTML to evaluate to something. So you quote the whole vector, and it prevents evaluation of the contents. In other words, this is a vector whose contents are the symbol net c grand and live html, the keyword as, and the symbol html. If I took that quote off, it would be a vector whose elements were whatever this evaluates to, the keyword as, and whatever this evaluates to. We don't want that, right? Because it probably doesn't evaluate to anything meaningful, so we get an error. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's a very good question. All right, cool. All right, so yeah, this you, and you, I, you know, every once in a while somebody asks a question that tells me the slides are in the right order. That was one, right? Um, so lots of things in Clojure evaluate to themselves, right? Vectors evaluate to themselves. Their contents might not, but the vectors themselves evaluate. When you say, what is the value of this vector? What's the vector? What's the value of a string? If you evaluate a string, you get the string. Numbers, same thing. But there are some things that don't, okay? One of those is lists. We know that. If you type in open paren plus two, three, you don't get a list. You get some invocation right, of the function plus. Symbols also don't evaluate to themselves. Right? And this essentially, this question mark right here, what do symbols evaluate to? That is essentially this talk. Right? This, you've got to understand namespaces. You've got to understand vars. You've got to understand what symbols are in order to answer that question. So I'm going to leave that as question marks for just a, just a little bit longer. And let's start to explore this. Let's start to dive down on it. So what's a symbol? Symbols are, are really, really simple things. Like if you go and look at the Java source code for Clojure, which I encourage you to do. I mean, it's, it's a beast, but you can find little pieces here and there that you, can, that you can understand. A symbol is really just a name with an optional namespace string. That's it. It's just a name. It has no value. Okay. The symbol foo is just a thing that contains the string foo. That's it. Symbols are names, period. 
What they evaluate to, that's another story. But if you look at symbols themselves, it's just a name with optionally a namespace string. Okay. Now, this is a little confusing, right? Symbols can have this bit before the slash. So here's a symbol with the namespace bar and the, and the name foo. We, we don't want to confuse that with um, closure namespaces, right? Like we have these libraries that we load that have an NS at the top. That's a namespace. It's got a bunch of stuff in it. We'll talk about what a, a closure namespace is in a minute. Um, there's an unfortunate kind of uh, um, convergence of terminology, right? Namespace, uh, symbols can have a namespace string, but that is not uh, exactly the same thing as a closure namespace. We'll, we'll, we'll clear that up as we go on here. OK, so a symbol, just a name. That's it. Maybe has a namespace string. That's all it is. No value. They don't have values. What's a namespace? Well, there's sort of two ways to look at it. One is that a namespace is this conceptual idea of um, providing us a way to get away from ambiguity. Right? Built into Clojure, there are two different replace functions. There's one in Clojure core, which is about traversing a sequence and taking out things that have some value and replacing them with a new value. So take out all the threes and replace them with fours. There's Clojure core replace. There's also Clojure string replace, which does string replacement. Okay? Both those functions are called replace. Why? Because it's a damn good name, right? I mean, that's what it does. And they should be both able to be called replace. But, but if, we, if we just had one giant pile of names, you really wouldn't have any way to refer to those things separately. So that's why we have namespaces. And I think people generally get that. Uh, who here has done JavaScript? Yeah. So you know JavaScript doesn't have namespaces, right? Is that fun? Is that awesome? Not a feature, right, of JavaScript. Namespaces are a good thing. Interestingly, Emacs Lisp also doesn't have namespaces. They get around it by doing what? <laughs> Tacking the name of the package onto every single function. So, you know, uh, uh, peredit hyphen, forward hyphen, you know, whatever. Okay? Uh, that's not namespaces. That's just really long names. Okay. <laughs> so um, that's one way to look at a namespace. It's a sort of conceptual place where we can put names so that we avoid ambiguity. Within this scope, these names are unique, but there might be other scopes that they're not unique. So it's a way to separate out names. Okay. Is that a question or just, just stretching? Okay, no problem. But if we want to work in closure, I think it's helpful to understand another way of looking at namespaces, what they are. Like if you go and look at namespace.java in the closure uh, source, it's an object that contains a bunch of maps, right? A, and a map in the closure sense, like open curly brace, key, value, key, value, key, value. What are these maps? They are, they are maps of symbols to things those symbols mean. Right now we're starting to get towards what are analyzing our program, right? We had Printlin in our, in our Hello World program. What does that mean? Well, we may have to go and consult a map to figure it out. It points to something. The symbol doesn't have a value. The namespace is a map that, or actually a set of maps, that gives those symbols meaning. Okay, this was a big breakthrough for me when I finally realized, oh, it's just a bunch of maps. Really, and you can get, that's really all you need to know about namespace. It's a bunch of maps. What does it map to? It maps from symbols, so we go from names, to maybe Java classes. Right? When you say integer in your code, oh, that's java.lang.integer. The namespace helps, helps you figure that out. Uh, aliases. We saw this already with require. Remember, requ require is load. Require is load, require is load. You could say require cgrand, or net.cgrand.inlivehtml as HTML. That's an alias. Where is that alias kept? In a namespace. Right? Wherever you said require, you're in some namespace. That namespace now has an entry that says HTML means net C grand and live HTML. Okay? Um, and it can also point to vars. A symbol can also refer to a var. Oh, what does that mean? What's a var? Yeah. Var is an association between a name and a value. That's it. That's all it is. This name means this. Okay? The value is often a function, like Printlin, right? Somewhere there's a var called Printlin. It's in Closure Core, Closure Core Printlin, points to a function. The function does something. It doesn't have to be a function. Vars can point to um, uh, numbers, strings, any value, right? Any closure value. Um, and it doesn't even have to point to anything. It can be unbound. How do you create a var? Death. <laughs> so we've been creating var. You, as soon as you start doing pro closure program, you're creating vars all over the place. Okay? So I think we've all seen this before. All written code like this. If you've done any closure at all, you've done something like this. You've said def foo. That creates a new var. There is now a var called foo. 
Vars live in namespaces. Where does this one live in? Ah, it lives in the sum name namespace. So if you say def foo, what do you get back? You get the var foo in the sum name namespace. What's its value? Doesn't have one, right? Vars don't have to have values. This one's unbound, we would say. Notice the syntax here for printing out vars. Uh, sharp quote namespace name slash var name. This little bit right here, this uh, sharp quote, that's called var quote. It's just the way that Clojure prints out vars. If you didn't have that there, it would be the symbol foo in some namespace. We don't want to refer to that. We want to say the var. Okay? Vars have values. Symbols don't. They're different. Okay? Does that make sense? And I think everyone's aware, but we'll mention it anyway. Um, defin is just a macro that expands to def. Okay, this is, this is the same thing as saying def some uh, bar to be some function that returns 2 plus its argument. So this is another way of creating a var. Th in this case, we're actually uh, binding the var to a value. There is now a new var called bar. Wow, that's a tongue twister. <laughs> Maybe I should have picked a different name. A new var called bar in the sum name namespace. Maybe I should have called it the Dr. Seuss namespace. I don't know. Um, right, so this is sharp quote, the var sum name bar. Make sense? Okay. So var associates a name with a value. OK, so now I, I, we have a basic grip of namespaces now, right? Namespaces are what? They're maps. What do they map? Names to meanings. What can those meanings be? Aliases, like if you do a require, requires load. Okay. <laughs> or uh, they could map to Java classes, fine. Or they can map to vars. And vars can have values. Wow, we're pretty much there. You can look at the maps, by the way, in the namespace. There's all these useful functions. Um, nsmap, for example, if you run nsmap and give it a namespace, it will show you those maps. What's, what does the user namespace look like? What are the symbol? What are the maps of symbols to values that it gives you? Call nsmap, and it will show you all the symbols that map to either vars or classes. That's kind of the broadest one. It shows you the most stuff. But there are others, too. You can say, uh, only show me the symbols that map to public vars with NS publics. You can say, only show me the Java classes that have been imported. You might have seen that before, like import java.io.file. Okay. What is that doing? It's making an entry in the import map for that namespace. Namespace is just a bunch of maps. Maps from symbols to, in this case, Java classes. Now, so I say import java.io.file. Now the symbol file means the class java.io.file. And you can look at that map with NS imports. You can actually say, show me what the symbols map to. Because that's all it is, a bunch of maps. Uh, and similarly, we have interns, which is, uh, the distinctions aren't, aren't super critical, but um, aliases, we saw this one, right? And refers, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Okay? So, like I said, you can run these. Here's what I would look like. You could say nsmap, give it the name of a namespace, which you can name by a symbol. Here we would say, what does the user namespace look like? Well, it's a bunch of uh, symbols. Maps, you know, there's a bunch of symbols that, that are in this namespace's map. Well, what are, here's the symbol sorted map. What does it map to? The var, closure core sorted map. What does read line mean in the user namespace, right? We're about, it's about giving meaning to symbols. It means the var, closure core read line. Or imports, I can ask about imports. What is process builder? If I have this, if I'm trying to figure out what the symbol process builder means when I'm evaluating a file, it means java.line.processbuilder, et cetera, et cetera. Right? You can totally do this from the REPL. It's, it's a really useful um, educational tool and actually kind of handy sometimes to figure out what's going on. All right, so uh, we kind of hinted, hinted at this on the last slide. Um, symbols, if, if you're in some namespace, the symbols in, that you're looking at in the context of that namespace don't have to be talking about other things in this namespace and good thing too, right? Because there's all sorts of awesome stuff in closure core, closure string, right? And we don't, get to, we don't get to mess with those namespaces. We have to write other namespaces of our own. We like to use stuff out of there. And we don't want to do that trick that we saw with require, where we have to say blah -de blah slash the function name. Okay? So this is refer. Okay? What, is, what does refer do? Refer makes an entry in the current namespaces map so that a symbol with no namespace part 
points to a var from some other namespace. This is called referring. Okay? So require is load. Refer is let me talk about stuff in some other namespace without having to say blah de blah slash whatever. Right? So require and refer. Different. Require is what? Thank you. I don't know what else that guy talked about, but apparently require is load. Um, so just like we had the uh, require API, we have a refer API. If we're in some namespace you know, somewhere, okay, we can say refer, give it a namespace name, and what does that do? That walks over to that other namespace. Okay? And using a mechanism very similar to where we saw that um, you know, NS map, right? NS map, you gave it a namespace and it would tell you, oh, here are all the symbols in that namespace and what they, what they, what they mean. It'll go, well, let me go look at that map, and I'm going to go ahead and copy everything out of that map and shove it in this map, right? Grab all those symbols, put them in my, put them in my map. So now, if I do this, there is an entry in this namespace, in the somewhere namespace, for render, the symbol render, with, with no slash, right? That means net C grand and live HTML slash render. That's how come we can call render without a namespace, because we've referred it, we've sucked it in. There is a slight problem with this, well, or not so slight, depending on how you look at it, which is um, at the point where you just say refer, who's in control of what's in your namespace map? Not you, right? The author of whatever libraries you refer, which means that who's in control of what symbols in your source code mean? Not you, right? That's arguably a bad thing, okay? So what you can do is instead um, you can say, refer, and then instead of a, a, just a symbol, you can give it a, a, a sequence where the first thing is the other namespace, and then the keyword only, and then a sequence of the symbols you want to refer. So what does this mean, really? It says, let me alter the current namespace's uh, maps such that foo means foo from blah dot whatever, and bar means bar from blah dot whatever, the var is from over there, but that, that's it. Nothing else. Don't just go ahead and blindly pull everything. And this is considered a best practice by many people. Okay. Yeah, question. Uh, the quote applies recursively. Yep. So the question was, why doesn't, for the, for the, for the record, why, doesn't, uh, why don't we have to quote in here? Why, does, why aren't foo and bar separately quoted? And the answer is that the quote applies recursively. Yes. Um, so the answer is that use is just require plus refer. That is it, right? There is no difference between use and doing separately a require and refer. Psh. Use, require, refer. Done. What's require? Load. What's refer? Give me virus from over there. What's use? Nothing new. It's just both of those things together. Correct. Correct. Their question was, would you previously have had to required this library in order to be able to refer? Yes, because what is refer going to do? It's going to go look for the namespace net C grand and live HTML and go look to copy a bunch of symbols out of its maps, or copy a bunch of entries out of its maps, right? You can't do that if that doesn't exist yet. And in order for it to exist, you had to have loaded that file. One thing I didn't mention earlier was that um, you can require as many times as you like. If you require uh, net C grand and live HTML, then require it again, and then require it again, it only loads once. Right? Unless you say require reload, you might have seen that. That's overriding. That's, not super important for purposes of our discussion, but but yes, you would have had to require this first, absolutely. Yeah, question. Is there a question? Is there a qu so the question is, is there a difference between using uh, these function calls, these operators, and using the namespace macro, where you have the you know the keywords colon require and colon refer? Not really. Um, we're going to talk about the namespace macro in just a few minutes, um, but it's. No, not really. I mean, behind the scenes, that's what's happening. The namespace macro is requiring, is referring stuff. And when you say use, that's just a require plus a refer. So it it's all comes down to require and refer. Oh, I, I almost didn't mention this. Um, I think it's pretty obvious from the usage now, but you can pull in everything. Or you can say copy all of the symbols from some other namespace, except for some subset, right? Is it exclude? Oh, I thought I ran this. I'm sorry. Yeah, Stuart has corrected me. This should say exclude. My apologies. Slide bug. Blame the technology, Craig. Um, all right, so a couple other useful things. Um, navigating. 
Right, where am I? What namespace am I in? Oh, I don't know. Uh, there's a bunch of useful functions you can look at here. Um, there's NNS. Who's seen NNS? Ever seen this? Yeah, so everybody's kind of seen it. What does NNS do? Puts you into a, a namespace. And if that namespace doesn't exist, creates it. What do you think's in the map when you call NNS? When you, if you look, if you were to say, you know, NS map, NS interns, NS imports, whatever, immediately after saying NNS and providing it, uh, the name of a namespace that doesn't exist yet, what do you think's in them? Nothing. Nothing at all. <laughs> Anybody ever do this? Anybody ever, ever do NNS foo and then try to do something like plus? It doesn't work. Why not? Because you haven't referred closure core, which is where plus lives. Right? But now you know how to fix that. You could say NNS foo, brand new namespace, totally empty, refer closure core. What does that do? Copies all the symbols from the closure core namespace map into your new namespace. Now plus means closure core plus. Right? So if you, ever, if you ever get into that situation where it's like, I know this function means something. I've just typed in an invocation of some function that's saying, I don't know how to find that. You didn't refer, right? Because it doesn't have any meaning in this namespace. Refer is about giving symbols meaning in this namespace, pointing to somewhere else. OK? Yeah, question. By default, does uh, closure your, 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 again, we're, uh, do you mind if I defer your question for just two seconds? Um, so uh, just, yeah, that's a very good question, by the way, which uh, we'll come to in a second. So um, the NS uh, var, there's a var called star NS star, which I think must be treated specially because you don't have to refer it itself. I, I, look, I traced through the code for a while but couldn't find it. Um, but you can always evaluate star NS star, and it will give you the current namespace. What namespace am I in? Okay. In effect, in NS is about changing the value of that. Right? Uh, and of course, we've all seen the NS macro, which is very handy. It, it binds up a lot of this require, refer stuff together. Convenient. Let's take a look at it. All right. Well, this is great because I think understanding this is where a lot of people would really love to be but have struggled with. And I think we've talked about everything we need to in order to completely understand what this does. Okay. So NS is a macro, meaning it blows up into a bunch of other code that does stuff. But what it blows up into is, is stuff we've already looked at. So NS foo bar, okay. what is this going to do? It's going to create a new namespace. How do you create a new namespace? Well, you just say NNS. So it's going to create and switch to a new namespace, just like NNS would do. What else is it going to do? Let's jump down for a second. Let's skip this for a second. Require closure test. Well, we know what that does. What does require do? Load. Yeah, that's it. Loads it. Does it alter the namespace map at all? Does it put new symbols into the namespace map? No, it doesn't, unless you say as, in which case it would populate the aliases map, but that's it. Okay. Use is require plus refer. Use is require plus refer. So what are we going to do? We're going to require closure.string. We're going to require closure.repl. We're going to load those guys up, and we're going to refer them. So we're going to copy the symbols out of those namespaces into this namespace so that now those things mean something in this namespace. There are entries for those symbols in this namespace map. Um, and in this case, we're only going to grab um, closure strings replace and closure strings join. We don't want all of them. Again, this is generally considered a best practice to do this rather than pulling everything in. I mean, there are times when it makes sense to leave off the only. Sometimes a library is so central to what you're doing that you just want all the functions, or you want all the vars, rather. But oftentimes you'll see people do this, and for good reason. Now you know why. Um, another thing you can do, and we didn't mention this yet, is you can say rename. What does this do? This is a map, so it's key value, and you can have more than one. So we could say, well, I'd like to refer some symbols from closure REPL. Um, and in this case, I haven't said only, so it'll grab all of them. But I don't, want, I don't want it to be called dir. I don't want the entry in my namespace to be for the symbol dir. I want it to be for the symbol ls. But I want it to point to the var uh, dir in closure REPL. Right, so at the end of this, we have an entry that would say the symbol ls in this namespace means the var dir in closure REPL. Does that make sense? OK, so let's come back here for a second, because um, this refer closure is something we haven't seen before. When you use the namespace macro, it automatically refers all of closure core, automatically, 
and it automatically imports all of Java Lang. So you get those for free. With NNS, you get nothing. Right? It just makes a new namespace, and there's, the maps are empty. When you use the NS macro, you're automatically getting entries for everything in Closure Core, and you're automatically getting entries for everything in Java Lang. So you can say integer rather than java.lang.integer. Okay? Now, that, that means that you're kind of um, screwed if you don't want to do that. <laughs> so the answer is that you can use refer closure, um, which is also a function. There's also a function refer closure. And this is just like refer closure core. It's just that because the NS macro is doing this um, for you automatically, we need kind of a hook. So you can say in your NS macro, you can say refer closure, and then you can, you know, you can do only, or you, I think you can, I'm pretty sure you can do only. Do you remember if you can do only? It would be pretty weird if you could do only, but you can certainly do exclude. This is the common case. And you can say, I don't want replace. I don't want closure core replace at all. Don't give me an entry for that one. Why? Well, maybe we're going to pull it in from closure string, right, so that we can avoid the conflict there. It would work, by the way, if you didn't have that there. It'll give you a warning. Everybody ever see that? Thing is being replaced by, or closure core, whatever, is being replaced by this other symbol. The rule is that um, if you're doing refers, and it's, so refer does what? It populates that namespace map. If it sees that there's a symbol in there that would overwrite, it'll error out unless the thing that was there is from closure core. Okay, so closure core refers, when you are doing a refer and replacing a symbol that refers to a var from closure core, it's treated differently. Okay? Oh, and then of course there's imports, right? I don't know if, I don't know if this has ever uh, been made explicit, but all of these guys uh, can take more than one spec. Each of these is called a spec. So here, this is a lib spec. It's just a symbol. It means this guy. You can have more than one, right? And the syntax, for example, for import says, well, if it's a sequence, then the first thing names a package, and then you have you know, classes from that package. But if it's just a bare symbol, then you know, we just refer to that one. So this is the same thing. The import here is the same thing as saying, import java.util.date, java.util.timer, java.util.random, java.sql connection. Just there's a shortcut syntax. Yes, question? Right. So your ob I think it's an observation more than a question, which is that um, sometimes when you're using the, the kind of the operation forms rather than the namespace macro, sometimes you quote, sometimes you don't. Um, it seems a little inconsistent. Yep, that's the way it is. You know, I mean. Uh, so how do you remember where, where it was? Well, I think the answer is that the basically the only time you wouldn't quote is import, and the reason for that, and we're going to get to this in a second, is that um, this this symbol, this is a symbol, java.sql.connection evaluates to a Java class, right? Uh, if you have a package qualified name like this, meaning blah, dot, blah, dot, blah, the rules for evaluating that symbol are it's the Java class object for that, the class so named. Whereas a bare symbol, like if I just say foo, right, the, the value of that symbol isn't necessarily something that has any meaning. So for example, What's the value of the symbol closure string? Like if I just go to the REPL and type closure.string, what does that evaluate to? Nothing, right? It's an error. That's why you have to quote it. Whereas if I go to the REPL and type java.sql.connection, what's the value of that? It's a class object. If you, say, if you ask what that thing is, it is an instance of java.lang.class. Is that right? Does that answer your question? So there is an internal logic, but, but honestly, the best way to go if you're at the phase of your closure career where you're kind of still trying to grok the NS macro is just to memorize it or look it up, right? Um, we'll, we'll get to that evaluation more in just a second. So is that, is that fine for right now? Oh, well, so why isn't, I'm sorry. I, I, answer, I think I answered a way more complicated question than you were actually asking. I think your, your question is, so here we are in the namespace macro. I don't have to quote anything. Okay, I'm sorry, I apologize. That, that, that is a very good question. And the answer is that this is a macro, okay? In macros, um, the rules are different. We're not going to go into how exactly the rules are different. But macros can prevent evaluation. So in this case, this symbol replace is not getting evaluated by virtue of the fact that NS is a macro. All right? so in, in macros, you are allowed to prevent evaluation. The NS macro does that simply for the convenience of not having to type in the quote. Did that better answer your question? OK, all right. I'm sorry, there was a question over here first, uh, behind you, actually. OK, great. So I'm I'll go here next. 
Sure. Let me, let me take one more crack at it. Okay. Both, t both ways of expressing the import form, right, you have this one, and you can also say import, like you type at the REPL without the keyword, um, allow you to specify either the whole class name, like this, java.sql.connection. That'll work. Or you can have, give it a sequence, where the first thing is the package name, and then you can have one or more class names. So if, ignore the second part right here. If you said in either form, import java.util, uh, you know, list, java util date timer random, just like this, that's the same thing as saying with no parentheses, import java.util dot date space java.util dot timer space java.util dot random space. Same thing. Does that answer your question? So there were some more questions. Yeah, right here? Oh my god. I, so you, so the question was could this could these parentheses right here be a um, be square brackets? Um, and the answer is that um, uh, this is a bit of a wart enclosure, and there was just a big debate on the closure mailing list about about the NS macro. Um, you know, uh, it, it's it, what you should. <laughs> yeah. I'm struggling with what advice to give you here. I mean, I believe this is this is the canonical way to write it. Uh, whoops, my laptop just went to sleep. <laughs> I thought I was running. Yeah, my laptop is trying to prevent me from embarrassing myself. Okay, so um, Stuart, this is the canonical way to write it. Yeah. yeah. So the answer is that the NS macro is wonky, and it will let you do things that are not this. Like you, I believe you could use a vector here, the square square brackets, um, but I don't know that that's guaranteed not to change. Uh, and and the reasons for it being are essentially historical. You really ought to write it like this. Okay. Sorry, and that's just to conform with the way everyone else does it, or not everyone, but most other people do it. Java. Dot, so when you use NS, it automatically imports all of Java.lang and refers all of Closure.core. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Yeah, this is. I mean, I'm happy with all the questions because. Right, namespace macro. Arr! So there's yeah the question is why is this colon use and not colon refer? Uh, the use is a require plus a refer. So this would have the effect of both loading closure.string if it had not already been loaded, and then also altering this namespace's map so that the symbols in the names in closure.string also have meaning here. Um, if clo if you knew for a fact that closure.string was already loaded, someone had already required that. There would be no you. You wouldn't have to use use. You could you could get away with refer at that point. And another question: If you in an, in the NS macro, full bar does not get loaded, right? If, even if it is there, you create a new namespace. Uh, I believe that's correct. I haven't tried that, Stuart. Uh, yeah, it's assumed that it's not going to load anything. Yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't do that. I mean, I. I if you want to work in a namespace. That is already there. Then in NS is a better a better way to do that. If you know that a namespace has already been required, then when you have the in NS operator that you can say in NS, you know, quote foo dot bar. Now the current namespace becomes foo dot bar, and if you say, you know, uh, you know, if you start doing things, the, the resolution of symbols will be from the from the maps that foo dot bar has. Does that make sense? Right. I mean, what would prevent you to go into a namespace and then, then using kind of the, the refer? Why would we want to prevent that? You, nothing would prevent you from doing that. In fact, this is a dynamic program language. That's a feature. Right, but you just told me not to do it. No, no. What I said was, yeah, so the, I, didn't, I didn't tell you not to do it. What I said was, um, I think you're referring to the only, right? The comments I made about only and about taking control of what's in your, of what's in your, your uh, namespace, right? The meaning of the symbols in your namespace. Um, yeah, that's a subtle distinction, um, and maybe we could defer that question until afterwards because we're starting to starting to wind down on time here. And I do want to I do want to cover one or two more things, um, but obviously this is a huge pain point for people. So, are there any more questions on NS? One more. Why does Java interop require a different form than use, require, and refer? What's, what's different about a different that it uh, Well, you remember we we talked about the fact that uh, uh, namespaces are maps from symbols to stuff. Uh, there are separate maps for 
the symbols that name classes and the symbols that name vars. Okay, so import is about altering the map that says these symbols mean that Java class, and refer is about altering the map that says these symbols mean those vars. Does it make sense? Okay, so this is kind of our big slide, and I, is that hopefully that's big enough to see. Uh, I can pump it up a bit. Um, so we're kind of down to the point now where we can answer the question, what does a symbol mean? All right? So first of all, if a symbol is namespace qualified, if it has a slash in it, then it must be talking about a var. And the thing before the slash must name the namespace. Either it's an alias or it's the full namespace name. So HTML slash render. Oh, that's got to be a var in the namespace identified by HTML. If it's not, if it's just a bare symbol, is it package qualified? In other words, does it look like a Java class? java.lang.integer. If it looks like that, then it must be naming a Java class. We didn't talk about this much, but it might be a local binding, right? If you have a function that has an argument x, right, x is a symbol. But that, that has nothing to do with the namespace. There's no var. That's just a local variable, you know, let or arguments. Um, and so in that case, it refers to the local binding. I think that one's obvious enough. Like, people get local bindings. We don't need to talk about that very much. Finally, if it's a bare symbol, right, a symbol that has no namespace string, there's no slash in it, then we go and look in those maps, right? Go and look through the, what is a namespace? A namespace is a map of symbols to the things they point to. So let's go look at them, right? What does printlin mean? Oh, it means closure.core slash printlin. And um, a kind of subtle point here is that if the symbol is identifying a var, the value of that symbol, the thing that if the symbol evaluates to is the value of that var. Remember, symbols don't have values. They're just names. Okay. This is an optimization that has to do with binding. We won't, we won't talk about that right now. I can talk to you more about it later if you like. And so that brings us back full circle, right? Now we understand this code. There's a namespace called hello. It's going to load another library called closure string, and it's going to let us talk about it using this, the, the alias stir. This is our first entry. This makes an entry in the namespace map. There's an alias entry. What does stir mean? means closure string. Defin, we're going to make a new var. The var is going to be in the hello namespace, because we created that namespace with the namespace macro. Here's another symbol, args. It's a local variable. Here's another symbol, printlin. It's in closure core. Well, how does it have that meaning here? NS automatically refers closure core. Here's another symbol, join. It has meaning because it's, it's it's namespace qualified. We look up stir in the in the alias map. Oh, that means closure string. This must mean closure string join. That's the that's the var over there. That is the function that joins strings. Bing. Right. So I know I ran over a little bit. So I'll I'll I'll, I'll we'll call this good. I think this was a good place to to get to. I hopefully everybody feels a little bit more comfortable with this stuff, and it'll help your uh, closure programming going forward. Thanks.